revealed the spiritual condition of the religious leaders and why they refuse to receive Christ as their Savior. And I want to preach this morning on the subject, why won't they come to Jesus? Notice, first of all, a wrong attitude kept them from believing. Mark chapter 11, beginning with verse 15. And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But ye had made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. Here in this passage of scripture, we read of Jesus clearing out the area outside of the temple of God because it was filled with people selling livestock that would be used as sacrifices. There were tables set up for money changers, those who would exchange currency of foreign lands into Jewish money to be used in the offerings. There were people cutting through this area, taking a shortcut, carrying various vessels to get where they were going. This area was considered holy ground. And all the stuff they were doing created a circus-like atmosphere that was causing all kind of noise and confusion to say nothing about the fact that animal droppings were polluting this sacred area and the money changers were ripping off the people by overcharging them. Notice what Jesus says in Mark eleven seventeen. He said, it is, not, it is not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you made it a den of thieves. Jesus was quoting from Isaiah 56, 7. And he was telling it right. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders, knew he was telling it right. Those merchants had no business being anywhere near the house of God. The interesting thing is, this is actually the second time that Jesus ran off the money changers and those that bought and sold. It's the second time he did it. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus did the same thing that he does here. The only difference being... The first time he made a whip from a cord of ropes that he used to clear out those varmints. Uh, John chapter 2, beginning with verse 13, listen to this. John 2, 13, and the Jews' Passover was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep, and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the tables. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Pretty cool. Now the Pharisees knew the scriptures. So did the scribes, who were the ones who would write down the words of God for the people to read. They knew the scriptures. They knew in their heart that Jesus was doing the right thing. But instead of rejoicing that somebody finally did something about it, instead of accepting his actions as an act of God, instead they wanted to kill him for it. Verse 18 tells us that their motive for killing Jesus was twofold. Verse 18. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. Here's the two reasons. For they feared him because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. Wednesday night I preached the message on overcoming fear. And we looked at 2 Timothy 1.7 that declares, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God won't give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love and peace. The fact that they feared Jesus, that fear wasn't coming from God, it was coming from the enemy. And the fact that they were upset by Jesus' doctrine, and that the people were heeding His words, believing what He had to say, it got me to thinking about this. Folks who are caught up in religion, whatever that religion may be, they get scared when someone takes out that, that pocket Bible and starts telling them about Jesus and starts talking about salvation. John 8, 32 declares, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. When I heard the gospel for the first time, I wasn't scared. I wasn't filled with fear. I had peace because I knew I was hearing the truth. And it was speaking to my heart. <clears throat> Folks that are trusting in their religion or trusting in their good works, they're filled with fear. They don't want to hear it. Put that thing away. You want to shake people up. 
take out your Bible at the lunch room. Take it out on, a, on online when you're waiting somewhere. Yes. Take it out in some public place. You would think that you just took out an Uzi or something. <laughs> They're filled with fear when they hear the truth of God's word because it goes against everything they've been taught and believed. For them to get saved, they've got to put aside religion and simply receive Christ as their personal Savior. And as far as doctrine goes, the Pharisees, like many folks, they had a head knowledge about the things of God. They had a lot of knowledge about the things of God. They knew the Scriptures, but they never received God's Word in their heart. Mm -hmm. Friends, there's a big difference between having head knowledge when it comes to religion and having childlike faith and receiving Christ as your Savior. Uh, Mark 10, 15, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Why didn't they come to Jesus? Because they had the wrong attitude. They were trusting in their head knowledge when they should have been trusting God with all their hearts. Romans chapter 10 tells us about this need to receive Christ in your heart. That it's a heart map, not a head map. Romans 10, 9, part of the Romans wrote, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, there it is, that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. There it is. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Matters of the heart. Let me just add this. This matter of trusting God in our heart doesn't only apply to salvation. It applies to every aspect of the Christian life. That's what living by faith is all about. Hebrews 11.1 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So the Christian life is a matter of trusting God with all your heart, leaning not on your own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledging Him, and He shall direct thy path. Proverbs 3.5-7 we're going to go through things that just don't make any kind of sense. That you can't figure out. We will deal with things we can't begin to understand. And our only hope of getting through it all is to trust God each step of the way. Yeah. That's living by faith. This brings us to the first question that they asked Jesus. As stated earlier, when Jesus turned over the tables of the money changers and ran off those sellers of merchandise, it made the Pharisees so mad that they began plotting how to kill Jesus. Notice the question they ask him uh, in verse 27. And they come again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, there come to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, and say unto him, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? That's the question they ask him. This question was a trick question meant to set Jesus up. Uh, Matthew twenty-two fifteen. 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. That's what they were trying to do. Uh, Luke eleven fifty three, And as he said these things unto, him, unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. Real spiritual, right? It's one thing if someone doesn't want to go God's way. Because they like living their life in darkness. You're going to run into people like that. They like living for the devil. And they don't make any bones about it. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. But it's a whole other thing when someone claims to be religious and they're living wicked lives. It was bad enough that the Pharisees refused to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But the wicked way they went about trying to set Jesus up and trap him in his words is inexcusable. In Matthew chapter 23, the Lord Jesus blasts the Pharisees and several times calls them hypocrites. And because of their wickedness, he declares in verse 14, Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. What about that? That statement tells me there will be degrees of hell. And that's a frightening thought. Depths of hell. Pharisees, because they were blind leaders of the blind, causing others to fall into the ditch, they will face a greater damnation. And that's a frightening thought. Why would they come to Jesus? Because of a wrong attitude. And secondly, because of, the, of their wicked hearts. Jeremiah 17, 9 declares, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I'll tell you who can know it. 
God can know. Yeah. And when the Pharisees came to Jesus, asking Him by what authority He did those things, He knew what they were up to because He knew the wickedness of their hearts. They were hoping He would tell them His authority came from the Heavenly Father, which it did. They knew what He had been already proclaiming throughout His ministry, and it was true. He was the Son of God. But they were baiting Him to have a reason to bring charges against Him. Jesus didn't answer their question, and the reason why He didn't answer their question Number one, because his time had not yet come. No one was going to lay a hand upon Jesus until it was time for him to lay down his life. That time would come shortly in a few days, but it wasn't come yet. And then number two, the Bible tells us in Matthew 7, 6, Give not that which is holy under the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Jesus knew the Pharisees were up to no good, and he wasn't about to give that which is holy to dogs or cast his pearls before swine. And let me just add this. We should do the same thing. If someone asks you a question about your faith because they're searching for answers or seeking the truth, then be ready to give an answer. Be ready. But if they ask you a question because they want to get into an argument or a debate or, or just they want to just mess with you, I don't have time for that nonsense. That's why I refuse to, to get into it with the Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses when they knock at my door. They're not knocking on your door because they're seeking the truth, because they want answers. They want to argue. And I try to be real patient and listen to what they have to say, but when I try to defend what I have to say, they tag team me and try to cut you off. Sorry, don't got time for that. Same thing when I worked in the prison. The Muslims will come up to you, uh, can I ask you a question? And then they'll use that as a springboard to try to uh, shove their Muslim faith down your throats and they won't listen to what you have to say. Don't have time for it. I, I just see it like this. Nothing's accomplished by arguing except people getting upset with one another. Put another way, pick and choose the battles you plan on fighting because we're here to seek and save those who are lost, not to waste our time in foolish arguments. Notice what Jesus does because it's brilliant. Rather than answer their question, he asks them a question. He literally turns the tables on them, and now they're on the spot concerning their an the answer that they give. Uh, Mark eleven twenty nine. 29. And Jesus answered unto them, I will also ask of you one question, and answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Uh, the baptism of John. Was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. And they reasoned with themselves, saying, it, it, they actually got a little powwow. Because they weren't sure what to answer. Because now they felt like they were being settled. If we shall say from heaven, he will say, well, why then did you not believe it? But if we shall say of men, they feared the people. For all men counted John, that he was a prophet indeed. And they answered unto Jesus, we cannot tell. And Jesus answering said unto them, neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. The Pharisees reasoned among themselves because they knew they were in a jam. Either way they answered, they were in trouble. They were either in trouble with the people or they were in trouble with God. Amen. So they said, we, we, we can't answer. Then Jesus shuts them down by stating, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Those Pharisees were well educated, but they weren't as smart as they thought they were. Because they, they realized, they would have realized you can't argue with God. Because those, the authority that Jesus had, they should have known that authority came from God. Turn over to Matthew chapter 12. Uh, Mark chapter 12, I'm sorry. The next chapter, Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 opens with Jesus sharing a parable about the Pharisees and their intentions to kill the Son of God. And the irony of the parable is that the Pharisees knew they were, that He was talking about them. 12 verse 12. And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. Earlier I mentioned the fact that the Pharisees, like many folks today, had a head knowledge concerning the things of God. And that's not enough, because salvation is a matter of the heart. Let me now mention another thing the Pharisees were lacking, and it's also keeping a lot of folks from giving their lives to God. Why won't they come to Jesus? Because there's no repentance. This is clearly seen in Jesus' parable concerning the publican and the Pharisee. You remember the parable? A publican who was a tax collector and a Pharisee went up to the temple. 
And that Pharisee, he was just patting himself on the back. I thank God I'm not like other men, not like this lowly publican here. And he went on and on about his achievements. That publican never looked up, just smote himself on his chest and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said that publican went away justified in the eyes of God rather than that Pharisee. As you talk to folks about their lives, you'll find that many people have regrets over bad decisions that they've made or they're sorry that they got themselves into some trouble or that they hurt others. But there's a big difference between being sorry and being sorrowful unto repentance. There's a lot of people that are locked up today that are sorry they got caught, but they've never repented of what they've done. 2 Corinthians 7.10 declares, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. If you're here today and you've been beating yourself up with regret, but you've never truly repented of your sins, it's the most important decision you'll ever make. It's a matter of salvation. It's not just one, two, three, repeat after me, just the same <laughs> prayer. I can hold a gun to your head and say, say this prayer. I can offer you $500 and say, say this prayer. Did you get saved? Probably not. But if you repent and need business with God, you can turn your life around today for His glory. Amen. Back to Mark chapter 12. Here in Mark chapter 12, the Pharisees asked Jesus a second question, and it's a doozy. Uh, look at verse 13. And they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. There it is again. And when they were come, they say to him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teacheth the way of God in truth. Makes you want to just gag how they're just, how they're just laying it on right there. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? Stop right there. They must have stayed up for days searching for the perfect trick question to ask him. And the fact that they came up with this question reveals how cunning they were. This was a cunning question. They were certain they had Jesus trapped because whichever way he answered, they could use it against him. If Jesus said, well, you should pay tribute to Rome, they would accuse him of being a friend of Rome they would have accused him of being against Israel and tried to turn the people against him. If Jesus said they shouldn't pay tribute to Rome, they would have reported him to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, and have him arrested for insurrection, which is stirring up trouble against Rome, a, a crime punishable by death. So either way he answered, they said, we got him now. The Pharisees were sure they had Jesus. Only one problem. You can't trap God. You can't deceive God with tricks. Let me stop here a moment and add this. One of Satan's titles is the accuser of the brethren. Reverend, uh, Revelation 12, 10. That's what he does. He is the accuser of the brethren. If he can't get you to give in to temptation, he will try to ruin your good name by falsely accusing you or slandering you. He doesn't care if the charges against you are false because he is the father of lies. Listen, because this is important. To avoid being set up by the enemy. To avoid getting ourselves in compromising situations that the enemy will try to use against us. You've got to use the discernment that God gives you. And that discernment comes from the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. The Holy Spirit will warn us when we're heading for trouble. He will tip us off when someone's trying to hurt us or do us wrong. He will make you aware of situations that ain't right, that don't feel right. Discernment comes when we listen to God trying to speak to our hearts. Discernment is heeding the Holy Spirit's warning and avoiding certain trouble. Notice in verse 14, it's almost like it's coming straight from the devil's mouth. Because the, they didn't mean a word they said. They're flattering Jesus. Beware of those that flatter you. They may be trying to butter you up so that you can let your guard down. Proverbs speaks over and over about being aware of the flattery of others. Notice Jesus' response because, again, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. In verse 15, Jesus said, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it. And he saith unto them, Whose is the image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And I just picture, if I was making a movie of Jesus taking that coin that he's got in his hand and flipping it right back at him. Just boom. Whether he did it or not, I don't know. Whose is the image of superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. And they marveled at him. 
First, he calls them out for their wicked game of entrapment. Why are you trying to tempt me? Why are you trying to trick me? Then he blows them away with his answer. He takes a Roman coin and asks whose picture is on the coin, and they said Caesar's. He then tells them to give Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. And they marveled at it. Dumbfounded. I believe you probably could have heard a pin drop after that answer. They didn't know what to say. Why didn't they believe? Why didn't they see the truth? Why didn't they come to Jesus? Because they were asking the wrong questions. Throughout this chapter, they're trying to get Jesus with trick questions. They're asking the wrong questions. First, they asked Jesus by what authority he was operating. Secondly, they asked him another trick question concerning paying tribute money to Caesar. Which brings us to the third question they asked Jesus. Verse 18. Then comes unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. And they ask him, saying, uh, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took her and died, neither left he any seed. And the third likewise, and the seventh had her and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, when this, they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to what? And Jesus answering said unto them, Do you not therefore err, because you know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? We'll start right there. Here in the third question, you can almost see the desperation in their efforts in trying to trap Jesus, because this question was flat out ridiculous. It was one of those hypothetical what if questions. Uh, what if God can do anything? Can God make a rock so heavy that he can't lift? Uh, what if Jesus changed his mind about going to Calvary? Could he have done it another way? Uh, what if God is real and this whole life is an illusion? Listen, you can what if yourself to death and come up with all kinds of weird questions, but the only thing that matters is what the Word of God has to say. Amen. 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 Whatever we believe needs to line up with the Bible. And if not, then we've got to change our way of thinking. Because the Word of God is our final authority. The Lord Jesus mentions this fact in the answer that he gives them. Verse 24, you do not, therefore, you do err because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. If you knew the word, you wouldn't be asking me those kind of questions. Right. He tells them the same thing in John 5, 39. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. There, in those statements, Jesus comes to the root of their problem. Because they didn't know the scriptures, they were asking the wrong questions. Many times when I'm trying to share the gospel with someone, they'll cut me off and say, hey, hey, hey hold on a second, I got, I got a question for you. Uh, who was Cain married to? Uh, uh, what was Noah's wife's name? Uh, 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 was Jesus black? Does the devil really have a pointy tail and horns and a pitchfork? Yeah. Is Obama the Antichrist? They'll ask me questions like that. Here's the thing. Those are all the wrong questions. Why? Because their souls are hanging in the balance between heaven and hell. And the only question that matters is the question that the Philippian jailer asked the Apostle Paul in Acts 16.30. He said unto them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Friends, that's the only question that matters because our answer, our decision will determine where we'll spend eternity. Amen. Paul's answer to that jailer's question, Acts 16, 31, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. If the Pharisees had asked Jesus that simple question, instead of wasting their time and Jesus' time by asking him trick questions, they could have avoided an eternity in hell. Maybe you're here today and you're not sure if you're going to heaven. Maybe you're here today and you've got a lot of questions about God, about eternity, about heaven and hell. If you receive quite Christ as your personal Savior, God will answer all the questions. Many times I've talked to someone, you got any questions? No, nope. you just answered all of them. After they got saved, suddenly they realized all those silly questions really didn't mean a hill of beans. All that matters is the fact that they knew they received Jesus today. Yeah. What a great thing. Yes. Why won't they come to Jesus? Why don't we all stand?